Okay, so we were, before the break, we were, um, we introduced uh, cross validation. And so we used the cross val score function to, uh, <coughs> to score uh, a specific model on a specific data set using fivefold cross validation. And you see that you can change, plug in uh, additional strategies uh, from scikit-learn here if you, if you need. And you get the average, you, as the output, you get the scores, the validation scores on each of the folds. Uh, and you can compute the average score to find the, the to compare two models, for instance. Uh, sometimes you might also want to compute the score of the model on the training set itself. Uh, it's a bit weird <laughs> uh, because it's, it's not going to reflect the ability of the model to generalize. Uh, if you really want to, to evaluate the intrinsic quality of a machine learning model, you should always compare on the validation set. But sometimes for debugging or for, to understand the model better, it's also useful to do the same on the training set as well. So instead of using cross-val score, you can use cross-validate, which is a more flexible version of, of cross-val score, but that will output a, a dictionary as a result. You, you give the same kind of a argument, but you can also add return train score equals true. And the output will be a dictionary with ad additional uh, <coughs> information like the training time, the test, the, the scoring time, how, how long it, it took to train the model and so on. And you can also get training scores and you can compute several, several metrics at once, like the accuracy, the rock score, the F precision recall and uh, all, all of this uh, at the same time. So here I'm just using it uh, to, uh, to compute the rock AUC score on the validation faults as we did previously, and we see that we get the, the same results. Uh, but I also do it on, on the training set. And here you see that the, the score on the training set is larger than the score on the test set, but it's still not 100% accurate. So can someone explain uh, why uh, the, the score on the training set is larger than on the validation set. Do you have an idea? Bias towards thing and someone else said overfitting. Actually, it's the, the difference between the two is the ability of the model to overfit the training, the training data. If the model has a lot of flexibility, it will be able to memorize perfectly the, tra the, the training set like a database will do, basically, to, re to uh, remember individual records. And when it see the, the same record uh, at prediction times, it say, oh, I know this, this one, and I know the, the answer, because I remember it. And so if you remember exactly the, the, the training set, then you overfit, and you can have a larger uh, accuracy on, the tra on uh, samples that look like the training set than on real new samples. And, but it's still not perfect. And the fact that it's not 100% is because the model has been constrained to not be able to uh, remember everything. And here on this decision tree, wh what is this constraint? Do you, can, can you explain what, what, is, what prevents the model to perfectly uh, remember the training set? Yes. The max depth, yeah, the maximum depth. When we build the decision tree, I will explain a bit more what it means. So where do I put my chalk? So assume that the, the model uh, starts with the, the, f uh, the, um, the full data set and uh, it, it computes some statistics and it discovers that if you consider the, the categorical variable, uh, the uh, continuous variable hours per, uh, hours per week, if you have a, a hours per week that is more than uh, uh, or less than 50, uh, uh, then uh, you have uh, all the samples in that leaf uh, that are low income, low income. They are all low income. And if you are, for all the other samples that have people who work more than f uh, 40 hours per week, uh, you can make another split, uh, for instance, on uh, 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 education years, for instance. Education. Uh, num, uh, for instance, let's say it's uh, above 12 or something, I don't know. Uh, then you, you split the data set again into, uh, <coughs> into two different uh, 
subset, and then you can iterate and and and, um, and select subset of the data set until you reach uh, leaves that are uh, either low income or high income, and they are pure. So if you don't constrain <coughs> the the decision tree, it will split recursively split the training set until there is only one sample in each of the leaves at the end, and this can be very deep. Uh, but if you if you constrain the model uh, to not split beyond uh, a depth of eight, for instance, then the lift will n will not be pure. There will be a mix of high income and low income records in in the leaves, and in that case, the model cannot uh, perfectly re uh, uh, remember individual records because they are not pure here. So this is a constraint to prevent the model from overfitting. Uh, constraining the depth of a decision tree, it's a, a strategy to prevent uh, the model uh, to um, basically to force it to summarize the training set in a way that is useful for uh, generalization. So as an exercise, you can insert uh, either, you know, actually you don't need to insert a new, new uh, cell. You can just play with the existing cell and reevaluate it by changing the maximum depth and uh, and uh, observe what it does change here and uh, try to explain that in the context of this. Actually, I already explained it, but uh, just check the, what it does. Yes. So for, for when we do a cross validation, we do the same operation several times, and we we consider each of the fold as a test fold. Um, Subsequently, uh, so and so we remove that from the training set. <laughs> a, a fold is basically um, you cut the the training set into subset, and it's a slice basically. Uh, it could be a subsample, uh, like it could be. It's not necessarily contiguous uh, elements, but uh, it's a subsample. Yes. Yes. So, uh, so the, the question is: for each of those classifiers, we start from from scratch. And yes, the, the those classifiers, when you train classifier one. Uh, you then you discard it you, you before training uh, classifier two, so classifier two will never see uh, because classifier one has seen the records in the fold number two here, and and if we want to evaluate classifier two, uh, its ability to generalize on new data, we need to make sure that it has never seen in the training set uh, this. Uh, well, how can it be? Not so the, the 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 constraint depends on the on the the nature of the statistical models. It, it it's independent of the cross validation strategy. The constraint here is depends on the fact that we we set uh, we told the uh, machine learning algorithm to not grow trees that are beyond uh, a depth of uh, eight. So let let me do it. So if I say Max depth equal one, for instance, there will be only one split in the trees. And you can see that the performance is degraded. Uh, it's 60% accuracy and both on the training set and on, te on the test set. So you see that the model has been too, too constrained. But now it's, it's not flexible enough to, uh, uh, to, to make good prediction. If we in increase, if we give it more flexibility by allowing uh, slightly deeper trees, 
you can see that the, the performance is improving uh, a lot, uh, but the, those two numbers on train and validation, they are still very close. And if I go around, for instance, seven or eight, uh, I get the maximum performance uh, on the validation set, so it's probably uh, the, the best depth. If I try nine, for instance, well, it's the same, but uh, actually it's, it's slightly bigger. <laughs> but there is some randomness here because we are in the, uh, uh, in, in the area of uh, non-meaningful uh, results. <laughs> but here, yeah, if it's too big, you can see that now the validation uh, the validation accuracy is starting to degrade a bit, and uh, the, uh, the the training score, on the other hand, is still increasing. <clears throat> and if I don't put the constraint at all, I can use none instead, and you can see that that's weird. It should be 100% accuracy. I'm not sure why. Maybe there are duplicated samples with different labels. I don't know. Um, I don't know exactly why it's not 100%, but it, it's very close to 100%. Because we didn't put the, the constraints so the leaves could be pure. And uh, basically, the model has the flexibility to completely remember the training set. But then, then in that case, it's, it's making decisions that are um, too noisy, basically. So we say that the model is overfitting in this situation. We have a, a, variance, a variance problem. And whereas when we put a, a, lot, um, a, a strong constraint like max depth equal one, it's basically biasing the estimator, the decision tree estimator, so bias on the decision tree, decision tree estimator. And this, in this case, it's too strong of a bias, and the model is underfitting, we say. Underfitting is when the, the, both the validation score and the training score are very close, and they are bad all the same uh, at the same time. Overfitting is when the two scores are, f the train score can be very good, but the validation score is not as good. And we need to find a balance with, between training, uh, with, between variance and trade-off, between underfitting and overfitting. In some cases, it's possible that we are underfitting and overfitting at the same time, which means that the train, the training score is not good, but the validation score is even worse, much worse. Uh, that happens on very difficult, very noisy data. Uh, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> um, all right, so if we go on, we can see that we can do a, a, a visual representation of this behavior of the decision tree model uh, by using what we call a validation curve. So there is a utility function in scikit-learn that will do this procedure se several times, and we, and we use matplotlib to, to display the results. So. It's basically doing what we did uh, manually by executing the same cell several times with different value of the max depth parameter and recording the cross validation score in green and the training score in red. And you can see that there is some optimal value of max depth so around uh, 10 or 9, um, 8, 8, 9, 10. Uh, and uh, when you go to 11 or 12, it's starting to degrade. And here we see the overfitting uh, behavior. And here we see the underfitting behavior. And here we have a good trade-off between the, the two. So now that we have found the best uh, uh, parameter for max depth, how could we improve the model further? Do you have a suggestion? Yeah, we could change the, the decision tree class and use a different kind of model, like a support vector machine. And wh what we are going to do, actually, is instead of using one single decision tree, we will assemble several decision trees that are trained on slightly uh, randomized version of the training set and average their prediction. And this is actually a very good way to, uh, to, to be able to, to train deeper trees without overfitting, because the averaging at the end uh, is uh, removing this. Um, so this, this is what we are going to do later. Another thing that we could do is also try to uh, pre-process the data in a better way, like uh, get better features, maybe enrich the features with additional data. For instance, if we have the city of origin of, uh, of the people, we could uh, collect uh, st statistics of the cities and merge them as statistics of the people, uh, and 
and use that as additional information to describe the, 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 the records and get better classification this way. Uh, so there are always two ways to improve stuff. Either you can improve the data or you can improve the, the modeling itself. And most of the time, the data is most important. But <coughs> because we are doing a tutorial on scikit-learn today, we, are, we will see first uh, the, how to, to, to build better models. Um, another thing to do, to, do uh, to analyze the behavior of the model is to um, plot the impact of the training set size. So it's the uh, same kind of utility. It's called learning curve instead of uh, validation curve. Uh, but this time, we will keep the max depth uh, parameter fixed. So for instance, if it's none, and we will increase the number of training samples. So we will train uh, five different models uh, on subset of the data. Um, here on the first point, we just have uh, less than uh, 2,000 samples uh, selected uh, randomly. And here, the last point is the full data set. So if you see that if I don't constrain the model, there is a large overfitting behavior. And this overfitting is actually larger when the data set is smaller. Uh, and you see that the validation score is increasing uh, slowly with uh, additional data. So when you have an overfitting issue, a very good thing to do is to try to collect more labeled samples it's actually the best way to combat overfitting, even though in this case uh, the model is, is too bad, but uh, <laughs> uh, we can s do the same uh, with a, a model of a depth uh, 15. And you can see that even the, the model at the beginning on a small training set with a 15 um, uh, depth of 15, it has enough flexibility to perfectly memorize a small training set. But when the training set is increasing, uh, the training accuracy is, is decreasing. And so it's kind of a, a, a boundary on the validation accuracy. The validation accuracy is never going to be better than the, the training accuracy. And, and so you can, <coughs> you can see the trade-off and the impact of the training size this way. And um, ideally, so if, you, if we take max depth equal 8, you can see that uh, for the, training, the, the full training set here, uh, we, we see that uh, the cross-validation score and the training score are very close. But uh, if we decrease the training set size, the, the gap is increasing very quickly. And if we constrain the model too much like this, this here, or maybe I can try even lower, you can see that it's constrained uh, from the beginning. And uh, the more data you add, you, you don't benefit from adding more data because the model is underfitting at the beginning. And so you cannot benefit from more samples. Uh, all right, do you have questions on this, or is it clear? Okay, uh, so as I said, as we said previously, a, a good way to, uh, uh, to go beyond this is to, uh, to build ensembles of trees. So there are two kinds of ensembles of trees, two families. There is the random forest classifier and the gra gradient boosted classifier. So instead of training one tree, we'll train um, 30 trees, in, for instance, but we have the, we can do that in two different ways. Either we train uh, many trees independently of one another and we average the score, or the other way, which is a random forest classifier, and the other way is to train a first tree and then uh, look at the errors, the prediction errors that it makes, and uh, train a second tree that tries to predict the errors of the first tree. And, uh, and, and fix it, basically, and then train another one that tries to fix the error of the past two trees together, and so on. And so you, you train new trees sequentially that, try, that are trying to fix, uh, to improve the errors of one another. And so this is what a gradient boosting classifier does, uh, basically. Um, and uh, the, the way, um, so in one way, random forest classifier, it's fine to use uh, uh, very deep trees. Uh, whereas for a gradient boosting classifier, we tend to use a shallower trees, like depth 3 to 8, for instance. Whereas with a random forest classifier, depending on the size of the training set, you can either um, set max depth equal none or use a lar large depth, more than 10, for instance. So we will try the two of them uh, with some parameters. Uh, usually when you increase the number of estimators, 
the number of trees in the forest, it's getting bit better and better until some point. But then it's also getting slower and slower because you have to do a lot more computation to train all the trees. Uh, so the rule of thumb is to increase the number until the number of trees until you see no improvement. Uh, and uh, as long as you're patient enough to wait for the, the training. In this case, for 30 trees on this small data set, it's quite fast. And you see that we have improved the accuracy, the, um, the rock score by 1.4%, uh, 1.5%. And for gradient boosting classifier, here I use 100 trees and uh, a maximum, um, uh, uh, the number of leaf is constrained to be uh, five at max. Uh, it's another way to constrain the depth. It's a different way to constrain the model. And you can see that the, accurate, the uh, rock score is even better. So it's actually very often the case that those two uh, models, they have approximately the same score, but gradient boosting tends to be slightly better. Um, it's not always the case, but it's very often the case. Uh, so this is why people doing Kaggle competition, they use uh, XG boost or gradient boosting or stuff like that. Um, so now that we have a, a, a good model, uh, we could tweak the parameters even further and we will show later with Tim how to do that uh, in a more principled fashion. Uh, but assume that this is the best model that we could select. Uh, it's good to uh, evaluate the model on the final test set and to compute some performance metric. Yes? Okay. So the, the question is, uh, does the um, uh, random forest implementation in scikit-learn do feature selection? Feature selection is just uh, dropping features that are useless. Uh, we will see later how we can uh, uh, ask the model which features are important to it. And, and then we could use that information to, uh, to uh, trim uh, explicitly those features. But by default, it will just compute stuff and don't use features that are uh, not, too much, uh, not too useful. But it will try them anyway. Uh, so you, it's uh, wasting computation to, to, to use too many features that are useless, useless and it's also a source uh, of a bit of overfitting. Even though for random forest it's not such an issue because it, by default it will uh, not use them too much. Um, but it's it's good to trim the features that are used less in general to reduce uh, overfitting and to increase uh, computational speed. Uh, the gradient boosting, uh, they have the same behavior, the random forest and gradient boosting in that respect. They can compute feature importances that you can use to trim the features manually if you want. Uh, we, will see, we will see that later. So let's, now that I have found um, this model, I, basically when I do cross val score here, I, I will uh, train many copies, five copies of the same model on different subset of the data. But I will not modify the original model, I will uh, modify copies. And I basically I select the hyperparameters of the models, those, those values. So now that I'm happy with those values, I can fit this classifier on the full training set. So I'm, I'm no longer using the, the folds, I'm using the full training set. And you see that it's taking uh, 1.8 seconds in this case, uh, because I'm using the person person time uh, magic here. Uh, and then I can compute the score on the real test set. And you can see that uh, my, my uh, final test rock is actually matching uh, the confidence interval of the uh, cross-validation. So it's a good sanity check. Uh, my cross-validation procedure is actually representative of the true generalization ability of the model. Um, and I can further analyze uh, um, how my model is making errors by using the, uh, the classification report function of scikit-learn, which is basically computing a precision recall and F1 score um, for all the classes, and in this case, the positive class is this one. Uh, so the, the, the precision uh, of, the, posi of the, um, the positive class is 78%. Uh, uh, it means that out of all the, po the, the records that have been predicted as positive by my model, 78% uh, of those records 
are actual true uh, positive uh, high income people. And the recall is the ability of the model to find them. So out of all uh, the high income people that I should have found, how many were, uh, were retrieved, uh, classified positive by, by the model? So you see that when you have highly imbalanced data um, um, classes, uh, it, you have a trade-off between the two. And uh, F1 score is an arbitrary way to combine them into a single score. Um, it, I think it's more important to look at precision and recall individual. And you can also see the, uh, the, f the number of records in each class. So it's informative as well. And there is another way to represent this, is to do a, a precision recall curve. And basically, we are, we are trying to uh, s set different uh, threshold. Uh, basic, by default, a classification model that has a predict proba function that outputs uh, probabilities of uh, the target class uh, will make a prediction of positive or negative based on whether or not the output is more than 0.5 probability. But we can change that threshold. Instead of 0.5, we could use 0.2 or 0.8. And by uh, setting to 0.8, our model will be more precise, but it will miss some positive samples. So the precision will increase, but the recall will decrease. And we can, by changing this threshold, get a, a line of the behavior of the model. So it's the same model that has been trained once, but we ch just change the threshold uh, on the outcome of the predictions. And, and we see this curve. So a perfect model will, will be a, will have a flat curve that is always one for all the precision level. I will have a, a recall of one e everywhere. But you never get this. Uh, so you get something like this in practice and you have this trade-off. And you could select a threshold, for instance, of um, here you have the threshold value. So you could uh, use that to find a dot here uh, where you have a precision that is higher than 0.8, for instance, and you want to find the best recall at that at that point, and it will be 0.6, for instance. It depends on your application. Sometimes you want to have models that are very precise and you want the best recall, or sometimes you want a large recall and you have a procedure later to filter out stuff that is uh, not interesting. So uh, in medical applications, for instance, you, you want high precision if you want to. I know it actually depends. <laughs> you can have a high recall uh, to find uh, um, uh, to diagnose a uh, disease and, and then uh, use additional um, um, scanning procedures to, uh, to um, refine the, the, the diagnosis, for instance. And you don't want to miss uh, possibly a deadly disease. So the, the, the threshold uh, array, you can have a look at um, 100 points Actually, I'm skipping many points, 100 points. Uh, this is the step size, basically. And you can see that the threshold, they are moving between 0 and 1. And, uh, and you can have a there. We don't have a good way to, to select the threshold in scikit-learn for a given precision. This is a tool that we should add in the future, but uh, it's not there yet. But you can do it manually using those arrays. So, and to come back to, to the question about feature selection, uh, once you have trained a, a gradient boosting classifier or um, a ra a random forest in scikit-learn, uh, you have this attribute feature importances with a final underscore here. This underscore is a, a marker that says that this, this attribute has been ex ex extracted from the data. It didn't exist before the call to fit. It, uh, it has been added after the fit. It, so it's good for introspecting the model after it has been trained. And basically, it's, it's a hat because it's an estimate. It's just that we don't, can't put the hat on top of the variable name, so we would put it at the end this way. This is the original uh, justification. So instead of uh, uh, having a look at the row numbers, what we can do is uh, use a uh, matplotlib and use the column names from the original pandas data frame and to visualize the, the height uh, of the bars, the, those are the feature importances. And you see that the most two important features according to the, the gradient boosting classification model is the capital gain and capital loss, then the age, then the education, and the uh, marital uh, status and stuff like that is not that important. And horse per week, the, uh, apparently is not that important once you know the others, basically. And what is good is that the race ap apparently does not impact too much the income. Uh, given the others, uh, and the education, the, the type of education is not 
informative when you know the number of education and, and so on. So actually those two features, capital gain and capital loss, uh, it's probably, I'm not sure, but uh, we need to check in the description of the data set. Uh, but I think it's the, the amount of capital that was gained uh, over the last year or lost over the last year. And basically, to, to, if you have a large gain or a large uh, loss in capital, it means that you are quite rich uh, in the beginning because you cannot lose money that you don't have. So you, at least you, you must have some high income uh, in, in the past. So they, they are quite informative. Um, it would be interesting to discard those two uh, values and then to retrain a model without them and see how it performs and see what are the uh, the, the uh, important features. Yes. Uh, because when if, if you do capital change, it's basically the, the absolute value of the sum of the two, or the difference of the two. Uh, you lose information. You have more information this way. If you train a linear model, it might help it to uh, to pre-compute the, the sum, because it's not going to... Even for a linear model, maybe it's uh, useful to have the, the two. You have more information. Yes? Uh, so the question is, does the feature importance attribute is unique to decision trees and uh, or decision tree based model? And yes, it's the case. Um, most of scikit-learn models, they have no good default way to, to give you uh, what is important uh, as a feature, uh, except for the linear models, like logistic regression, for instance, uh, or uh, least squares or stuff like that. Uh, you have the coefficients and you can directly interpret the coefficients of the linear model. Uh, if they have a high magnitude, it means that they are important. Assuming that you have your data is scaled, uh, so it's not necessarily easy to interpret. And here you see that the, you see the importance, but you don't see whether or not it's um, um, positively or negatively uh, correlated to the outcome because it's a nonlinear model. So actually you could have a variable uh, you, you could have a continuous variable as the input. Uh, that, that, and uh, suppose that this is uh, xi, uh, some, some uh, input variable, and this is the, the target variable, and assume this is a regression problem and not a classification problem, so it uh, could be a continuous value. And, so, and the output could be related to an input like this, uh, which means that uh, they, are, they are very correlated, but uh, a big value of xi does not necessarily mean a big value of uh, of uh, y. And a random forest is able to to, to deal with these nonlinear uh, dependencies. So there is no good way to say that uh, xi is positively uh, it's it's pos it's positively correlated with uh, xy if xi is positive if it's there and uh, it's doing the opposite in in that region. Whereas a, a linear model on this kind of feature uh, would not be able to benefit from it. Uh, okay, I think we stop here for this notebook. And uh, you can go at the end later if you want. And it's a way to build your own uh, estimators to make it even better and to get uh, by using a Facebook paper. It's a couple of lines of uh, Python code to, to get to combine logistic regression and gradient boosting together, basically. So uh, the next notebook is about hyperparameter optimization. And uh, Tim is going to introduce it. OK. So I clear the cells. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> Uh, I, I don't remember at what time should we stop? Uh, like this. Okay. Yeah, so living in Switzerland, I was thinking, okay, my train is going to be late because it's a German train, it's not a Swiss train, anything. And, um, so I thought about that, and then I did not think at all about uh, what happens if it's my fault to be late. So I have no uh, good excuse or, or joke or anything like this prepared. 
um, besides being incredibly embarrassed. Huh? Um, <laughs> okay, so now we will talk about uh, hyperparameter optimization. And the idea is, so far we already investigated what happens if you change the max depth of your decision tree. You also have um, tried, you know, single decision tree, gradient boosted trees, random forests. All these things are what I would call hyperparameters. So the parameters that you adjust, basically all the parameters that you pass in the constructor to a estimator in scikit-learn are hyperparameters because you have to choose them. You don't learn them from the da data directly. And I would include in that the choice of which model you use because that's something you decide when you wake up in the morning and then um, you need to try different ones. So you can either do that by hand, by changing the value and retraining the model and you know doing all that, or because that's something you do very frequently in scikit-learn, there's tools that uh, automate a lot of this for you. So the first few... So should I restart the kernel or you think it will work? I will, I will, I will, we'll see. We'll see what happens. So the first few cells in the notebook um, just repeat what we had in the previous one. So they load the data. And in this case, actually, you can see I just use uh, get dummies um, because I was too lazy to do the categorical encoding in some smarter way. Um, then we split the data and So because I find that when you discuss with people and you call it train test splits um, and then you reuse the word train and test split for your individual folds, um, people get the super confused. So I decided some, some time ago that at the beginning I will always split my data in something which I call the development set, which I use to develop my model. And then there's a second part called the evaluation set, which essentially you forget that it exists until you're really um, sure that you're done with your work. And this is uh, what Olivier called the test set. Um, okay, and then one more thing. We, we train a classifier and we see that we get back the same uh, AUC score as before. And now the question is, How would, you, how would you go through trying these values in a more principled fashion than we've done so far? So in scikit-learn, there's something called grid search CV. And this does exactly what the name suggests. You build a grid of hyperparameter values that you want to try. And this grid could be a 1D grid. So in this case, I just define for the parameter called max depth that I want to try values 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, and 32. And then you pass them to grid search CV uh, as a parameter. You define what kind of scoring metric you want to use. And then grid search CV behaves just like any other estimator in scikit-learn, which is, you know, uh, a trivial statement to make, but it's actually super useful that you, you know, there's no, nothing special you need to know about it. You instantiate it and you call fit on it. And then it goes off and now it tries all six of these values and does a cross validation for each of the values and you know all this all this stuff that normally you would see as a for loop is wrapped up inside it. So then the question for you is can you print out the values of max depth that we used without looking in the pra so th the trivial solution to printing out these values is to look yeah to print out pram grid that variable right so you can do that but there is a a different way of doing it so you can look at the attributes of the grid search uh, object and it contains all sorts of information about uh, what went on on the inside and that will tell you what values it's tried. And 
Um, you can also find the train and the test scores and all sorts of other information in there. So I'll give you some time to start poking around. Ba basically do grid search dot and then hit tab for tab complete. I think you will find uh, what you're looking for. Okay, so the question is, for other things which are not uh, scikit-learn estimators, you would like to search the parameters? And no, so the, the short answer is yes, and at the end of the notebook I will talk about one more. So it's not part of scikit-learn, it's called scikit-optimize, um, and that is something which you can use to find parameters on any kind of algorithm. Um, yeah, but that's a completely different, you know, story in, in principle. Yes. Yeah, because inside it does cross validation. So you can see, I don't have a. Mm -mm. I can't find it, but there is a, a parameter called CV equals, which you can either give uh, an integer to or a more sophisticated CV object. And they will use that to do the cross-validation on the inside. And the evaluation data you essentially leave to the side until the very end. Has anyone managed to find the parameters? Yes? Or you want to ask a question? Okay. So, yeah. So this is the the key attribute to look at is this CV results underscore, and it it looks like a dictionary, and it contains lots and lots of interesting uh, stuff. So all the parameters that you searched over, there will be an entry that starts with param underscore and then the name of the parameter. And then you also have the mean training and testing score um, for the different folds. So you can print them out and potentially make a nicer uh, table than this. And then one thing that will help also towards later is you can make a plot similar to the validation curve that we had um, in the previous notebook and plot what the testing and training score is. And I would just go and copy and paste the code for that because it will, you know, printing it out as a table is a little bit uh, hard to visualize what's going on. So I would go and copy and paste the code from the um, validation curve example previously and modify it to use the values from the grid search. Yeah. That's the, the next exercise. I will wait. <laughs>
Okay, so if you if you look at what I did, this is essentially a copy and paste, but you now pass the name, well, you, you continue to pass the name of the parameter you want to uh, make a plot for, and you pass this CV result object. So then you can look up the scores for this parameter, because we know that if that is something that you pass to your grid search, there will be a entry called param underscore the name of the parameter. And then there used to also be some stuff that deals with averaging the training scores from the cross validation, but grid search CV already does that for us. So you pull them out and then you make a scatter plot instead of a line. Um, so these are the only differences between what we had before. And if you do that, Luckily enough, you get exactly the same curve as we had before. So the, the only thing that's missing is that the x-axis is not log scale anymore. And you can see you know, at the beginning, the red dots and the green dots are on top of each other. And then as we increase the max depth, they start uh, spreading apart. And, and the training score keeps increasing until it gets to 1, as you would expect for a super complicated model but then you can see that it doesn't do very well on, on the training data anymore. So then the next thing to do is to extend the grid search to now also search over a parameter called max features. And you know, I would just try 3, 6, 12, 24, 48, and 96. And it should be a one line job for you because all you have to do now is in your parameter grid add a new entry and list the values that you want to try and then you can rerun the grid you have to reinstantiate the grid search object and then you can run it again and everything should work as before it will take a little bit longer to run because there's more values now to try um, but otherwise it's as before Yeah, so the question is, does grid search exhaustively search the search space? And the answer is yes. So I forgot to, to mention that. That is why it's called grid search, because it will make a grid of all possible combinations and will try all of them. Um, and Yeah, so then the next thing to do is... Uh, in, I don't know, half a screen. Um, and I, I, I'll, I'll give you an answer in a second, but I'll let people type and then talk at them. Yeah, so you could, I think all of you should be able, should be there now, and you could already see this took quite, took a little bit longer to run than the previous one because it tries a lot more values. So yeah, all you need to do to add an extra dimension to your grid is add a new entry to your param grid dictionary and list the values you want to try, and then everything else stays the same to the point that we can reuse um, oh, we'll, we'll get to that um, we, we could reuse our plotting functions and so on uh, to plot the results for individual parameters because the contents of the CV result object stays the same um, another thing to do is to try and pick the um, best set of parameters out of your CV result object. And then for you to think about, should you pick the ones which have the best test or the best train result? 
And then we wait uh, one more screen to get to your question. <laughs> Yeah, so for for 2D, you can, so the question was, or the statement was, it's more difficult to visualize, and that's true. So for, for 2D, you now need to make some kind of contour plot. That's just about what we can still do and understand. And yes, in 3D, 4D, 5D, it becomes super difficult to try and uh, visualize. Okay, so how many parameter combinations did we just evaluate? Did somebody managed to find inside the grid, C, grid search CV object uh, the answer to that. No? Okay, so there should be several uh, attributes which contain um, results or uh, an exhaustive listing of all the parameter combinations tried, so you can take the length of that. Or for 2D, you can also do, do it in your head, probably. But, um, yeah, and then you can, if you want to pick the top rank model, you can ask um, the results object again to tell you. Uh, how they are ranked by the test score, and then this, you know, all, all of this picks out some of the information about the uh, model that was trained and prints it out. So you can see then your your best uh, model has a score of uh, eighty nine point seven or point eight nine seven, and these are the parameters that led to uh, that kind of score. And then there's potentially something that you can learn from looking at what slightly lower ranked models, do they have completely different hyperparameters? Do they have similar hyperparameters? There's, you know, potentially something you can learn about what the, um, what the search space looks like. And yeah, for 2D, it's maybe still doable. And then 3D, then it gets more complicated and yeah. But you can see, for example, the the difference between the the top model is and and the, already the the third rank model is significant. So there's uh, it makes sense to search for these hyperparameters and not just use the default values. So here now we can reuse our pl plot grid scores function. And what you will see is that there's now lots, lots more points for each value of max depth. Does anybody have an idea why that happens? Yeah, so that what, what happens is that for each value of max depth, you also try several different values of max features, but you're always evaluating it at the same value of max depth. Or if you made the plot, plot the other way around, you would also see uh, six values of max features, and then uh, the other dimension of this problem collapse onto this. So. This, together with uh, your question of what if I have a very big grid uh, that I don't want to evaluate every possible value, um, the answer to, to both these problems, because now what, what you did here is you spent an awful lot of time evaluating the model, but we still don't know anything really about what this uh, the shape of this curve looks like in more detail than if we just did um, six points for max depth. Uh, but one way around this is then to do a random grid search. So now you specify the distribution or even 
yeah, the distribution of the hyperparameter, which can be a, a random, a uniform uh, random number generator. And then you say, how many values do I, or how often do I want to evaluate the model? And you pick a number that is consistent with how much time you have to uh, wait. And if you do that, so the, the answer to, or the, the name of the class to use is randomized uh, search, because it will just pick points at random in your, in your grid. And you have to also specify your uh, grid slightly differently. You cannot, or you can also just list explicitly values if you want to, but usually people give a distribution from which you can draw a random number. So in SciPy stats, there's lots of uh, these distributions and if you have for example if you have an idea that smaller values you want to sample more finely or larger values you want to sample more finely than uh, small ones then you choose a different distribution to sample from for your hyperparameters no so uh, I'll wait for it to run and then I'll show you how we can find out. Um, because I'm not... Um, <coughs> okay, so we don't get to use... Uh, the built-in help in the notebook because it, it's running now. But luckily you can just type your, essentially you type your question into Google and you. Um, so what did we want to find the answer to? Max features. Um, so there you go. So there's a, in the way the decision tree is built, you could say that I only want to consider a subset of my variables when I'm trying to make a split in the tree. And then the question is, how big should this subset be? Uh, and this is what Max Features uh, controls. So it's a, another way yeah, to influence how the tree is grown. So now I have to go back. Yeah, so this is a run by now. And the, the important thing is, so we gave a distribution um, for our, our, our hyperparameters. And we also had to now choose how many um, times we want to evaluate or how many values we want to sample. And this essentially, you decide up front how long do you have time and uh, then you set it. And if you now uh, make the plot again, you can see you get a much better view of how things change as a function of max depth. Because chances are that every point you pick at random from your parameter grid will have a different value for max depth. Yeah, so now we get a very nice uh, curve showing what, the, what happens as you increase this. And this is particularly useful if one of the dimensions of your um, search space doesn't actually influence the performance of the um, classifier. So sometimes it happens that um, one of these hyperparameters you can essentially set to any kind of va any value that's legal, and the performance of your classifier doesn't really change. So if the problem with this is you don't know upfront usually which hyperparameter that's going to be. So if you build a, a grid, then you spend an awful lot of time evaluating different values of this useless hyperparameter and you learn nothing else about the, or you don't increase the amount of knowledge you have about the, the shape of the distribution for the other hyperparameters. Whereas if you pick them at random, then it doesn't matter so much that one of them is completely useless because you do get a new point on the dimensions where there is uh, some variation. So you can also in increase this now to, to three, 
And if you carefully pick the range for min samples per leaf, so this is the minimum number of samples you want to have in a leaf, it again stops the, the splitting early. Um, if you carefully pick the range for that, then you have a kind of an example of a parameter. Um, did it, oops. Uh, you, you can see that the performance for this one, at least in, within that range, doesn't really vary very much. Um, so that, that's an example of a parameter that maybe in this problem doesn't really affect the solution. Um, the other thing you do see, though, is now the now that we've increased the number of dimensions, it's not so clear anymore that the max depth of eight is really or ten is really the the cutoff point. Uh, um, the the gap has become much smaller between the red and the green points, and that is kind of because for each point here, there's a, a potentially a completely different you know two neighboring points here have completely different settings for max features and min samples leaf so it starts becoming more difficult to see uh, what the what the behavior is just for this parameter so then the but you can just ask your uh, random search object what are the best parameters and it will tell you these are these are, they have the highest test score and then um, you can even keep using the grid search or the random search CV object as if it was a fitted version of the best classifier, um, which is why it's so nice that it behaves exactly like a, like a classifier. Okay, so if random search is still not good enough for you and you want to do something even smarter, then there's Bayesian optimization, and that uses a library called Psychic Optimize which you can also use for things which have nothing to do with the uh, scikit-learn uh, if you want to. And the idea is, so neither grid search nor random search somehow learns from w the points is already evaluated. Yeah? So in grid search, we decide all the values of the hyperparameters that we're going to try up front, and then we just go through them, and we try all of them, and you know, we wait until we're done. Uh, in random search, also, we decide the distribution. We decide how many values we want to try or how many values we can afford to try, but we learn nothing from the first few values that we try. No, we just pick, we keep picking them at random. So you can do something smarter than that. And this is, this comes under the name of Bayesian optimization or sequential model based optimization. These are the two, uh, names for this. And the idea is very simple. You evaluate a few points, and then you fit a regression model to, um, whereas as features you use the value of the hyperparameters, and you try and predict what the score of your classifier is going to be. And then you say, well, now I have a regression model. I will go to where the maximum is of my um, predicted score, and I will evaluate those hyperparameters next. Now that's a super simplified version of what Bayesian optimization does. Um, and does that make some amount of sense to you guys? Yeah? So, yeah? Okay, so you mean, what if I, what, what is the difference between random search uh, predict and random, uh, yeah, so if, if you, after fitting random search, if you call predict, it will use the estimator which is in random search dot best estimator. So that's a way to extract or look at it. If you but the best estimator is only using the parameter. Really? Potentially because So 
So max features 91, max features 91, max depth 18, max depth 18, and some book sleeve. So for me, it does seem to work. No, I mean, this is what it should do. Okay. It should it should not happen. Uh, uh, yeah. Ba basically, the this is a the best estimator attribute is a way to go and look at it or poke around at it. So, for example, if you wanted to extract the feature importances, I don't think random search has a feature importance or feature weights attribute. And then you have to go to the actual estimator. Ah, sorry, yes. So the the question was, um, what is the difference between the best estimator underscore attribute and using random search directly as a as an estimator? And the answer is there should not be a difference. And we were discussing that sometimes it happens. Yeah. Um, ba -ba -ba. Yes. Ah, yes. Okay, so the question is, why use Bayesian optimization instead of gradient descent? And the answer is, for example, for the value of max features, what is the derivative of rock AUC with respect to the setting of max features? And I think nobody knows how to compute the gradient for this, which is why you cannot use an optimizer which relies on the gradient. Which would, it, it would be great because you would probably get there much more quickly. So instead you have to use something which is at least uh, is an optimizer that doesn't need gradients. And then Usually, also, it's very expensive to train your model. And then uh, the third kind of, or 2.5th reason, is that the answer you get is also noisy. And because it, of the randomness in the, how the splits are done, you will get... Uh, yeah, and so this then leads people to doing Bayesian optimization instead of, for example, um, you could use genetic algorithms, for example, as well, but they tend to be very costly, or they require a lot of function evaluations, so that becomes very, very costly. For example, if it takes, you know, a day to train this model, then, yeah. Or if you're, I don't know, alpha go or something, you know, weeks of GPU time. So the question is, how much risk is there to get stuck in a local optimum? I don't know. I don't know a good general answer to that. Um, yeah, I, I mean, Bayesian optimization. I will. I will talk about on Thursday, um, in in more detail. But I think, as much as I love it. And I think it's very clever. It seems the, at least the received wisdom at the moment is if you can afford to rent twice as many computers to do your problem, keep doing random search at twice the speed or three times the speed or four times the speed. And you will probably beat something like Bayesian optimization. Uh, in, not in terms of how many CPU hours you use, but in how many human hours you have to wait. So the question is, can you improve on, on random search with Bayesian optimization? The answer is yes, or probably. Because what Bayesian optimization does to get started is pick some values at random to, to initialize everything. And then it fits a model and tries to pick the next best point to go to. Because you can't do that until you have a few values that you've evaluated. OK. so. If you manage to install Scikit-Optimize without internet this morning, then you can 
import a class called base search CV from uh, Scott, and it has an interface which is almost exactly like a grid search CV or random search CV. So again, you provide your classifier and in a slightly different notation, the dimensions for your search space. And also you tell it how many points it should ev evaluate. So for fairness, maybe we should do uh, 36 as well. Actually, let, let's see if with 15 we also get there. And then you call fit on it with your development set. And now actually we have to wait a little bit because it's not just picking points at random. It actually fits a model and optimizes some functions to try and pick the next point and so on. So it takes a little bit longer than just picking them at random. So you see, you know, you recover again, there's no magic here. You recover the same behavior of, of max depth as you did before. Um, but you can see there's, uh, for example, a big hole here. So there's some, potentially some intelligence in Bayesian optimization that it, you know, doesn't try intermediate values. It goes to a bigger one uh, fairly quickly. And then you get a very similar um, score for your best. Uh, setting. And again, if you want to, you can print out the best parameters and, and the best score and it should really look like uh, one of the grid search or random search CV objects in um, scikit-learn. And this is the end of the hyperparameter optimization thing. I think if we do some more categorical feature, feature engineering, then you could come back to this because you can build then a pipeline which contains, you know, as a choice how to do your feature or how to encode your categorical features and optimize over that as well as the settings for your classifier. And then now you have, I don't know, a 5D space or something like that. And it starts really getting uh, more complicated. And I would say if you have a small space, make something uh, use grid search CV and just try all the values because it's cheap. Then it, as it starts getting bigger, maybe start using random search. And then if you have a really, really large number of dimensions, then maybe and in, start investigating Bayesian optimization. But that also comes with some caveats. So it gets difficult the more dimensions you have. So the question is, can you parallelize Bayesian optimization? And the answer is a little bit. Um, so the problem you're trying to solve is you're trying to look at what you've evaluated so far to make a prediction of where to try next. And if you want to do that massively in parallel, you have no results to look at when you need to make predictions of what to try next. So the benefit of doing this complicated Bayesian optimization stuff becomes smaller the more in parallel you want to do things. So in scikit optimize, there's some things which I would say can do, I don't know, maybe a, fa a factor two or four in parallel, but much beyond that, I would not, I would not use it. No, by default, it's turned off because you need to think about what strategy you want to use to um, deal with the fact that you're trying to make several predictions in parallel. So yes, for random search and grid search, you can just specify uh, an end jobs parameter and it will just run in parallel, which is why I was saying if, if, if your limit is human hours and you can afford to buy more computers, then random search is a very good strategy because it's trivial to parallelize. Ask your question again. <coughs> a 
Okay, so can you learn more about which hyperparameters are important um, using Bayesian optimization? Yeah. Yes and no. So in scikit-optimize, we have a few functions which or methods that allow you to make plots. Also for, for higher dimensional things. So for example, you can make partial dependence plots. Um, and that's maybe a way to learn something about your, your uh, search space. Um, but I have, to, I have to say that often, if you know nothing about the search space, interpreting the plots is hard work. It is very nice if you already know what it looks like, then they always make sense. But if you, in a real world setting, don't know anything about it, it's still very hard work. I find it very hard work to try and deduce something. For example, to decide, did I get stuck in a local optimum or not? Which is the, the biggest question and it's, it is, it's extremely hard work. Um, So, yeah, I, I will answer a slightly different question, which is how do you pick what the best parameters are? And the answer is you pick the parameters which, you, which give you the best test score. Yeah. So now the trap to, that a lot of people fall into is use this number as the... Um, their prediction of how well the model is going to perform on unseen data. And that is clearly not the right, or not clearly, it is not the right thing to do. Because what you, what you could do is you could try a bazillion hyperparameter combinations and you will find a model that performs best. And it is probably one which, where you are, are catching a, a lucky fluctuation upwards. Um, so that's why you need to have your evaluation data set, which you can then use to m evaluate the performance of your model with the hyperparameters that you've chosen. And this number then you can use to make a prediction about how well it will, will generate, uh, generalize. It was, yeah. The Bayesian optimizer fully deterministic if you apply to the random Yes, if not, it's a bug. Any more questions? Ah, yeah. Yes. So, yes, you use the test score to find the best hyperparameters. Yeah, so this is what I was saying before. Do we overfit? If you try enough values of hyperparameter combinations, then yes, you will get a good test score, which is purely due to the fact that you've tried so many of them, which is why it's so important to have your evaluation data set. You know, at the, you remember at the, very, at the very beginning of the notebook, I split the data into our development data set and an evaluation data set. No, exactly. So we only use the development. So we still, at the end of the notebook now, have some data left that we've never used. And this is the one you need to use to make a prediction how well it will generalize. And if you try a huge number of hyperparameter combinations, you will see a very big gap between the test score that the random search reports and the score on your held out data. And then the answer is yes, you're overfitting. Oh. Yeah. Is there a way to optimize the gap? Obviously, you would be using the validation data set during training. So your question is, 
how do I make sure that I'm not s evaluating too many different hyperparameter combinations and essentially become overfitting those? If you want to minimize the overfitting behavior. Yeah, I think that, I mean, then you could, one thing you could look at is nested cross validation. Um, there's a nice example in the scikit-learn documentation. But essentially, you will always have the problem that you need to keep some data secret and you can only look at it once. Um, because otherwise, you know, you're influenced by what you saw, the performances on that data, and you use it to refit your model and then you you know, now you've lost your chance to, to make an unbiased estimate of your performance. So, what was the difference between the training score, the testing score, and the validation score? So, the, the testing score is the score of your model on the data that you use to uh, train the model, which like Olivier explained. Ah, okay. So, is like, like Olivier explained the, the, the test data, you can achieve perfect performance on it by just memorizing um, the answer to the examples that you're seeing during test uh, d during training. Then the test data is data that you kept aside um, and didn't use... Oh, okay. So, no, but, so this is actually, I think, an important point. Everybody you want to discuss this with at any level of detail, you will mix up the words that you use because, yeah, you have to at least use some of them twice. Yeah, so what I, what I always do is I have a development set which you use to do all of your development. And then there's a, a part of the data which is may, maybe you call eval, evaluation set, which you split off at the very beginning of your project and you never ever look at it. You look, at, you, you know, you give it to your boss or somebody else who will not give you access to it. In Kaggle, for example, the private leaderboard is, is this. Yeah, you, you never get to see it until the competition is over. And then within your development data, you can now split it again into a training and a testing set if you want to, or you do this uh, cross validation where you make a f you know you split it in five chunks and then each part of the data set plays the role of being the training data and the test data at some point uh, and then frequently then also people talk about well they have train and test data and then they need a word for the other data and then often people call this validation data or oh, some people does that make some sense? Okay. So, the, no, the question was, uh, if, if you look at the result of your model on your evaluation data, are you, can you go back and change it again? And the answer is no. No, the really is the Kaggle competition is over and then you look at the evaluation set and you know either you win money or you don't win money but you don't get to make any changes ever again you have to collect new data the, the, so the question is So the, the question is, 
would it made your it could have made your grid search better because it, your data is larger or that somebody invents a new model that you didn't know of the problem is if you if you want to predict how well your model will work on data that it's never seen then you need to have data that it's never seen and so there's nothing really you can do that once you look at the result and use it to inform your decision making on changing the model this is as if the model has seen the data. So we will, oh no, yeah. Uh, so just uh, another comment on, on this. The, another way to, to see it is that typically the, ev the true evaluation evaluation set is the future data that you're gonna, going to collect in the future uh, and you don't have access to it at all. <laughs> it's just that when you deploy your model in production you see ah, it's not as good as I hope and it, it's basically a way to, to check that you didn't make any uh, mistake in your model selection procedure that you didn't leak uh, information or you didn't use uh, information that you shouldn't have. And uh, yeah, it's the, the only way to check that if you deploy your model, you're, you're not going to uh, degrade the performance of the production uh, system. And actually, people, what they do in practice is they use A-B testing, is that they, they, they deploy the model only for a fraction of the users on the, on the future data of a fraction of the users uh, to check that it's actually improving the, the performance of, of, uh, of the system on those uh, respect 1% of the users, for instance. And if they notice that it's actually uh, not improving but degrading the performance, then they stop and, <laughs> and they say, we, we made a mistake. <laughs> um, uh, just uh, also something for the, the Bayesian. So th just there is a, a third notebook that we won't have time to do today because it's the end. Uh, but it's uh, just a couple of words about it. Uh, going back, yeah. Uh, it's about uh, categorical feature engineering. Uh, I think it's uh, so. In in, in this, uh, fuck. <laughs> all right. Uh, uh, so in in this tutorial, we used uh, integer encoding, which is fine for our decision trees. We could have used uh, dummy variables, and actually, uh, team used dummy variables like one at encoding. Um, which is also fine, but maybe less efficient for decision trees. And here it's actually diving deeper into what it means and how to do it manually with uh, pandas and how to wrap that uh, as, as a class, a scikit-learn transformer that you can then use in a pipeline. And then there is an exercise to do it using the pandas API. Uh, and there is another example on how to do the integer encoding using the Pandas API as a scikit-learn estimator. And uh, yeah, there are many, many more ways to do a smart uh, categorical variable encodings. And I have put a reference here. It's a, a presentation, it's a slide deck that is uh, very good uh, on feature engineering. I don't remember the, the author of this uh, slide deck. Uh, Van, Van Vin, apparently, from Brazil. And uh, and there are many ideas there uh, that are useful. And there is also in scikit-learn contrib uh, a project which is called categorical encoding, which has also a, a additional uh, transformers for categorical variables. I think this is uh, like good preprocessing of categorical variables and good preprocessing of variables in general is very very important, and it's not often treated in machine learning tutorial because it's not really machine learning in itself. But in practice, this is what makes. Uh, a data science project works, so I think you should uh, invest some time uh, in, in this. And I think we should stop here because it's over. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>